So I want to begin by having you imagine with me uh, the following scenarios. First, picture a middle school student or a high school student uh, sitting before an exam for which he or she has not quite adequately prepared. How many high school, middle school students are here today? Okay, I, I know most of you probably study really, really hard. Um, but imagine one who hasn't studied a lot hard, and so they breathe a prayer, a desperate prayer, a hopeful prayer, asking for inspiration and guidance in choosing A, B, C, D, or E, all of the above. I always thought there should be another one, F, at least one of the above, but that didn't work so well. <laughs> but it's a desperate prayer. I've been there and done that. Or a parent who prays for the safety and spiritual well-being of a college student 500 miles from home. Uh, if, how many parents of college students are here today? Okay, you've probably uh, prayed a prayer like that. Or a Roman Catholic Christian uh, recites prayers as he or she prays through the rosary. A worried mother prays for a toddler after fever spikes to 103 degrees. If you're a mom or dad, you know what this prayer is like. Or a man in debt prays for a winning lottery ticket. A basketball player standing at the free throw line with 10 seconds to go prays, help me hit these two free throws, just these two free throws. That player's parent, father in the stands prays, just keep me from throwing up right now. <laughs> all these situations different, but all of them, different as they are, have one thing in common. Prayer. Surveys consistently show that the vast majority of Americans pray and pray regularly. It's across denominations, across religions, across uh, even, even among those who consider themselves irreligious, unconnected, even atheists. Most of us pray. The Barna Research Group shows that 80% of American adults pray regularly. Pew Research says that 55% of us pray at least once a day, and even some 20% of those who consider themselves irreligious, irreligious, don't go to church, don't necessarily even believe in God, pray with some regularity. And that's really interesting when you stop to think about it. But what is prayer? Who or what do we pray for? Is there a right way to pray? Is there a wrong way? We just finished a series of messages called Wrestling with Jesus. And over the last three weeks, we wrestled with Jesus about politics, about money, about sexuality. And today we began a three-week series called Praying with Jesus. Over the next three weeks, our message titles are going to be today, Prayer as a Lifestyle. Next week, How Not to Pray. And then the third week out, How to Pray. And all the way along, uh, our guide is going to be Jesus himself. We're going to look at what he said and how he lived to see what we can learn about this mysterious subject that we call prayer. Now, the passage we're going to begin with today is in Luke chapter 5. And before I read this very short passage, I want to let you know that of what happened immediately before the passage we're going to read, and that is that uh, Jesus has just healed a man who was, the Bible says, full of leprosy. Now, leprosy was one of the most feared diseases in that day and time. It was seen as a curse, and Jesus healed this man by touching him, which violated all kinds of religious rules of the day. He touched this man, and so word began to spread like wildfire about what Jesus had done. And so we pick up this story in Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 15. Luke writes, Yet the news about him spread all the more, so that the crowds of people came to hear him, and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Now you need to know the next story Luke tells goes right into it is Jesus healing a paralyzed man. The story of the man who had to be let down through the ceiling of a home because the crowd was so great they couldn't get through the crowd. So tucked away between two miracle stories are these two little verses and it would be easy to focus uh, on the miracle stories. They're miracles. Healing of a leprous man, healing of a paralyzed man. But what we want to focus on today is these two little simple verses that are kind of just connector verses between two great stories, but they're really more than that. Because in these little verses, Jesus actually models for us and teaches us some very important things about prayer. First, he teaches us that prayer, properly understood, is a lifestyle. So prayer is a lifestyle. I had a chance last weekend to visit my mom and dad who live 
uh, in Ohio uh, in a little apartment attached to my brother's house. My dad is 85 now. My mom is 88. And as some of you know, uh, she's struggling with um, progressing dementia in her life. Uh, but one of the most important things my parents did uh, as we were growing up as kids was to make prayer uh, part of our everyday lives. Uh, my dad was a pastor, so you can imagine that church was very central to our lives. But what we learned was that prayer wasn't something we just did in church. Prayer was an everyday thing uh, in our family, in our house. My parents prayed with us in the morning before we went off to school. We prayed before every single meal time. Uh, they prayed with us every night as we went to bed. So prayer sort of bookended our days every day as we grew up. And one of the prayers I remember my mom praying repeatedly uh, was for the special woman uh, that someday, who would someday become my wife. And she would start into that particular prayer, and I could hear it coming because of what the words she would say. Uh, and she would start into that particular prayer almost often at bedtime. And she would start into it, and Lord, and for that special, and I'd be, Mom, I'm 12. You know, that's, that's a ways away. But she prayed that prayer over and over and over again. She was relentless. Uh, but I have to say I'm grateful for those prayers today. So prayer, just, so prayer was part of our everyday lives, just like mealtime or bath time. And we've tried to do the same thing in our family. Not perfectly, but we've tried to do the same thing. Look again, listen again to these words. Yet the news about him spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. So this tells us Jesus' public ministry is exploding. It's exploding. People are, are, are flocking to hear him. Overflow crowds every day, bringing their sick, wanting him to heal. They've heard what he can do. They've seen what he can do. People just trying to get close to him. Verse 16, but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Uh, I think we want often to focus on how Jesus prayed. We're curious, how did he pray? What words did he use? Uh, did he kneel or did he sit? Did he fold his hands? And we're going to get in a couple of weeks to how Jesus prayed, the words he used. But today I want to ask a different question. I want to ask the question, not how he prayed, but why he prayed. Of all the things he could have done, to get a break from the daily pressures of his growing ministry. You know, he could have taken a walk, maybe on water. He could have gotten some exercise. He could have read a book. He could have taken a nap. He could have turned water into wine. Of all the things he could have done, he prayed. I mean, this is Jesus, the ones we, one we as Christians believe is the eternal Son of God, who was with God and was God from the very beginning, the creator of the entire universe, this Jesus prayed. And when he prayed, he didn't go to the great temple of Jerusalem, where the ancient Jews believed the very presence of God dwelled in the Holy of Holies. He didn't go to the local synagogue, which was also seen as a holy place. He went to a lonely place. He wasn't keeping religious rules. He wasn't observing a kind of religious ritual. He was pursuing a relationship. And there was something about prayer that Jesus needed and wanted, like he needed food, water, and air. And I think we need to see two things here. First, that G prayer came naturally to Jesus, but secondly, prayer took effort. For Jesus. First, prayer came naturally. Luke tells us that Jesus often withdrew to pray. Now, the sense of the language there um, in, the, in the Aramaic and Greek is that Jesus was in the habit, the regular habit of withdrawing to pray. Uh, even a superficial reading of the Gospels, if you read through them, uh, you can't help but notice that this wasn't something unusual. This is something Jesus did all the time. It was just kind of how he lived. Let me give you some examples. In Mark chapter 1, we're told that right after Jesus healed Simon Peter's mother-in-law from a fever, imagine that day, there were no antibiotics, nothing to control fever. Uh, Jesus healed her of a fever, and then the whole town showed up at that house wanting to have their sick family and friends healed. In verse 35 of Mark 1, we read, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, this is the next day after the healing, 
Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Mark uses the same exact word Luke uses for solitary place, a word eremon, which we'll talk about more in just a moment. Then in Luke 6, this is the night before he would choose the 12 apostles. Luke tells us in verse 12, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. So the night before he made the decision of the 12 men who would become the apostles, he prayed all night. And I imagine a good portion of that night may have been spent wrestling over the choice of Judas as one of the 12. In Matthew chapter 14, after receiving the heartbreaking news that his cousin John the Baptist had been executed by Herod, we read in verse 13, when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Again, Matthew uses the same word for solitary place, Eremon. And one can imagine here Jesus grieving alone in prayer, the loss of his friend and cousin. Just a few verses later, Matthew 14, 23, after an exhausting day of teaching that included the miraculous feeding of 5,000 people, we read, after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. See a pattern? See a pattern? And then this, in Luke chapter 11, the whole chapter begins with this verse. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord... Teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Now, I think this is a beautiful little thing. We'll come back to it in a couple of weeks. But after watching Jesus and being with him for several months, maybe who knows how long, they ask him, teach us to pray. Now, they knew what prayer was. They had grown up with all the traditions. They knew prayer, but they didn't know how to pray like that. They wanted to pray the way he prayed. We'll look at the Lord's Prayer, which he taught them in just a couple of weeks. So all these situations and life situations are different, but the one thing in common is prayer. It was Jesus' habit to withdraw to pray. Next, I'm going to look just a bit at this phrase, lonely places. The word used to uh, translate it that way is the word eremon. It means desolate, unpopulated, barren. It can refer to the wilderness or a mountainside. So it could just mean that Jesus... Uh, preference was to uh, get away from people, go off by himself somewhere outside uh, and pray. But there is a small cave near the Sea of Galilee where Jesus spent much of, the, uh, much of his time early in his ministry near the Sea of Galilee, and that place is called the Eremos Cave. This is a view from down below, uh, closer to the sea, and you can see a small cave up there in the hillside. That's called Eremos Cave. This is closer up you can see it's large enough for maybe four or five people to sit in there. My wife and I and Pastor Jeff and his wife sat in that cave a couple of years ago when we visited the Holy Land. And this is the view from the cave looking out on the sea. It's a beautiful spot. And there's a tradition that this very cave, called Eremus Cave today, is where Jesus preferred to go It was his lonely place. And that would make sense because he lived nearby, a simple walk up the hill. He could sit there overlooking the sea and pray. I wonder, do you have a favorite place where you pray? Do you have a chair, a room, a place you like to walk? Jesus may have had a favorite place, and it was his habit to go there often, alone. This tells us what, while prayer was natural to Jesus, as much of his life as eating or sleeping, prayer also took effort. It says he withdrew to lonely places. In other words, prayer was intentional for Jesus. He put down his busyness. He left his work that had been given to him by God himself. He left his friends. It took time. And in this way, prayer was hard. And I think the same is true for us. In one sense, prayer is easy. It comes naturally. We were created for it. Pastor Tim Keller writes that prayer is one of the most common phenomena of all human life. That is, people throughout history and across cultures have always prayed, looked to something beyond themselves, the mysterious, the mystical. The ancient writer of the Ecclesiastes explains it when he says, he, God, has set eternity in the hearts of men. I believe that Scripture teaches us that we are, as human beings, hardwired to pray. We may not understand that. 
Human beings pray to different beings, different things in different ways, but we are hardwired to pray, to connect with that which is greater than ourselves, to connect to the eternal. But prayer is also hard. It's hard because we live in a world that relentlessly deprives us of what I might call prayer space. We live in a world of calendars and appointments, emails and text messages, a world full of work and entertainment, a world with a million distractions. When I kneel to pray first thing in the morning, which I try to make my habit while it's still dark, I'm an early morning guy, um, I have a place, but every morning I'm aware that there's a newspaper to be read, there's emails to be checked, there's sermons to be written, appointments to be made, and before I know it, that's what I'm thinking about, right? Sometimes I feel like I have the, even after all these years, I have the attention span of a gnat. I'm not sure how long that is, but it's not very long. It takes an effort to, to calm my thoughts and to center them, to still my heart. And other times, I'm, I, I'm tempted to see prayer as unproductive. I mean, I, I got to get things done. I'm not getting anything done. I think you know what I mean. Here's what we need to see. At this point in his life and ministry, Jesus was busy. Do you ever think of him as being busy? Busy. He faced demands on his time and energy every day that would have crushed most of us. Throngs of people hoarding, he, can you heal me? Can you heal me? What do you have to say today? He had to get away from them, sometimes in a boat to escape the pressures of his everyday life. And yet here he was in the habit of withdrawing, carving out precious time, space, and energy to pray. We have to ask, why? I think the answer is that Jesus... Even Jesus needed something that he could only receive and experience through prayer. So he made prayer a way of life, his lifestyle. And that's because he knew, secondly, that prayer is also a relationship. Prayer is a relationship. Uh, I recently was part of a video conference that was focused on what are called emerging adults. Now, the term refers to people, uh, men and women, between the ages of 18 and 29. Just out of curiosity, how many people are here today between the ages of 18 and 29? Just raise your hand. Okay, there's a bunch of you here. Um, the conference was about how uh, challenging that phase of life is today in our culture. If the marks of being an adult are finding one's vocation and then becoming financially independent, it takes longer to do that today than at any point in North American history. It's harder for lots and lots of reasons. And sometimes in our marriage and family-centered culture here in the suburbs, we don't see that group very well and we don't listen to what their life experience is. So I'm glad you're here today. The church needs what you have to offer and looking back, I was an emerging adult before they even used the phrase. I was an emerging adult for like a decade of my life, back and forth, living at home on my own, living at home on my own, find this job, that job, this job, grad school, and all that sort of stuff. And part of finding my vocation was a ministry internship I had at an inner city church in Pittsburgh in 1982, a long time ago. The senior pastor of that church was a friend of my father's, and he had graciously allowed me just to hang around their church for a summer and to learn what I could. I was seeking that out as a possible vocation. I didn't know for sure. And I still remember my very first staff meeting uh, that I was invited to. I'd grown up in a church, but never been in a staff meeting before with the senior pastor right there. So we gathered in the pastor's office, and uh, he had this big chair that we, <laughs> behind, sort of behind the scenes, called his throne. But the big chair behind the desk, he sat in the, he, w he was behind the desk to the big chair. We were sitting around, four, there's three or four of us, small staff, in front of the desk. And when staff meeting was supposed to start, he got up from his chair, kind of ceremoniously, and he, he slowly turned around and he kneeled down on the floor behind his desk and leaned his head and his hands on his chair. And I was kind of surprised. And I, I glanced over at the youth pastor like, oh, we supposed to kneel too? I didn't know what to do. And the youth pastor just went like, no, don't worry about it. It'll be fine. And then the pastor kind of groaned and then launched into this, one of the most eloquent, formal, 
prayers I had ever heard. It was like the magnum opus of prayer. I'd never heard anything like that, like five minutes of it. It was incredible, beautiful. Uh, now, part of that was just his way of praying as I got to know him. He's kind of old school. That's how he'd been taught in seminary and so forth. But there was also a little part of it I learned was kind of him showing the rest of us who was the, who was the prayer boss in the room. And it was him. It was respectful. It was holy. But it, but it wasn't terribly personal. I remember thinking, imagine a child coming to his or her father like that. O most high and exalted Father, I humbly beseech thee that thou wouldst grant me from thy abundant generosity in advance of my allowance. Now some dads are like, well, that wouldn't be so bad. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 says, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Now, we're going to talk about this particular passage much more, in much more detail next week, but I want to point out, point out one key thing here. Notice three times in this one passage, Jesus uses the word Father. More particularly, he uses the phrase, your Father. Now, most of us are so accustomed to the word Father being attached to God that we don't really hear the surprise and power of what Jesus is saying here. Uh, Tim Keller has written in a book on prayer that Jesus was the very first person to refer directly and personally to God as Father. Now, God is referred to as Father in the Old Testament, but mostly as the Father of the nation of Israel. But in every prayer of his except one in the New Testament, Jesus calls God Father. And here's the surprise. He tells us to do the same. Now, here's the power. Only the gospel allows us to pray like this. Only the gospel allows us to call God Father. Here's why. The gospel promises us a new heart through the forgiveness of sin, new identity by being adopted as his son or daughter, which we'll come back to, new purpose to serve in his eternal kingdom, new destiny to live and reign with Christ forever, new heaven and new earth. Now let's go back to identity for a moment. The gospel says we have been adopted To address God as Father means that we've been legally and spiritually placed into a new position, into a new relationship, once alienated from God, now children of God. Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 8. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Jesus called God Father, Abba, an Aramaic word that just remains, means my Father. It's a personal term, and we get that. God is a Trinitarian being, existing for all eternity as God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So God exists in relationship. The Son calls the Father, Father. It makes sense to us. But the gospel tells us that by Jesus, through Jesus, we have been given that same exact status, that same standing as sons and daughters. Therefore, we can pray to God saying, Father. Only Jesus gives us access to a new relationship with God as Father. So only, only, with Je- only by Jesus can we pray this way. And that leads us to the third thing about prayer. Prayer is a lifestyle. Prayer is a relationship. And thirdly, prayer is honesty. Honesty. I'm going to tell two stories uh, between now and the end of the message from my own experience of prayer, both of which I've told before. You may have heard them before. In a way, I always hesitate to share personal stories of prayer because they may not be the way that you experience prayer. They're personal. But they were so formative in my understanding and my life that um, I can't not tell these stories. So, when I was in my mid-20s, smack dab in the emerging adult phase of my life, I was wrestling hard with God about vocation. I believed he had called me into ministry at that time, but he just didn't tell me how to get there. I didn't know where to go, what to do next. 
So I was doing everything I knew how to do. I had two undergrad degrees by that time. I had a master's degree at that time, but nothing to show for it. Didn't have a job, didn't have any money, didn't know where to go. I'd even applied to a, uh, an elite uh, seminary grad program in California uh, that I thought he wanted me to apply to, and I got rejected. So I was pretty frustrated at that time. One night I decided I was going to duke it out with God in prayer, which is a dangerous thing, by the way, but it's a good thing. I was going to duke it out. I was going to pray till I had an answer. I wasn't going to take no for an answer. I was going to pray till I had an answer. So I prayed in all the ways I knew how to pray that night. I don't remember how long, but long time. All the words I knew how to say. And it just, like, the longer I prayed, the, 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 just nothing. Just nothing. Nada. I mean, like, like cone of silence. Remember, get smart, cone of silence. Like, like prayers weren't going, just bouncing off the ceiling, coming back. And so I kind of lost that. I went on the little balcony behind my apartment. And I remember, as at night, after midnight, I remember literally standing on my, like, like a cartoon character, shaking my fist at the darkened heavens and yelling out loud, neighbors would have thought I was crazy, where, so where are you? I'm doing everything I know how to do. And then I spoke to God in some ways I wouldn't even speak to a person. And I was scared because I shouldn't talk like that to God. And in that moment, instead of a lightning bolt, what I sensed was God chuckled. He just chuckled. And he said, <laughs> you have finally been honest with me. Now we can do business. I learned something really important that night, painful as that was. Didn't get any clear answers but I knew he would wrestle with me. And that is that God could handle my anger. God could handle my frustration. He could handle my questions and my confusion, my disappointment. So I wonder, have you learned to pray like that? Have you learned to yell at God? Maybe the right way to say it is, have you learned to wrestle with him about prayer and in prayer? I think there's evidence that Jesus prayed like that. You say, where, how? The writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 5 writes, During Je the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries. Now that word fervent is a word that means loud crying like a wounded person making unearthly sounds. That's the word. Groans, cries, wailing. And tears to the one who could save him from death. On the night of the Last Supper, Luke tells us, Luke chapter 22, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, one of his other favorite places to pray, and his disciples followed him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. And then we all know as his life ebbed away on the cross, Jesus prayed one more time, this time quoting the haunting words from Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We don't know, of course, but I think it's quite possible that often that when Jesus withdrew to those lonely places, uh, he poured out his heart to his Father, maybe even using words from the Psalms that he would have memorized by heart by that time in his life, like Psalm 13. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Or maybe Psalm 69, save me, O God, from the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths where there is no foothold. I've come into the deep waters. The floods engulf me. By the way, using scripture is a great way to jumpstart your prayers. I've told people before, read through the Psalms until you find one that says what your heart wants to say. And then pray it. If prayer is a relationship, then there can be no genuine relationship without honesty. Isn't that right, even in our relationships? Honesty is confession. Confession is opening our hearts to the God who already knows who we are and what we carry with us and loves us anyway. Confession not only of sin, but of anger and pain and grief and stress. So, back to the question, why did Jesus pray? He prayed because for him, prayer was a lifestyle. He prayed because for him, prayer was a relationship. And how did he pray? With honesty. He started with honesty. 
around the same time as that night, I, I shook my fist and yelled at God. I had another experience that was far different, but just as formative and surprising. I was, I was again, praying, looking for direction, what to do, where to go next. Should I go to seminary? What should I do? How do I get a date for Friday night? You know, those kind of things. Um, I was trying to follow my call, and, I, and as the words kept tumbling in my head, I sensed, um, after again, after some time, I just sensed the, the Lord telling me to stop talking. You know, I've heard all this before. I know, what you're, I know what you're saying. Just stop. And then he said, quietly, my name, Brian, I love you. And I said, I know that, I know that, um, but what I really want to know is what to do next, where to go next. He said it again, Brian, stop, I love you. This time I said, I know that, I've known that since I was a child, you know, for God so loved the world, blah, 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 I want to know where I should go, what, I do, what do I do? And he said it the third time, a little more forcefully this time, Brian, I love you, and at the third, at the third time, Tears sprouted to my eyes, and that doesn't happen to me very much. <coughs> and I didn't know why for a long time. But eventually I figured it out. What he was telling me was that I was his son. What he was telling me is that my identity was not in what I did for him, not where I went for him. My identity was found in his love for me. And that night... I learned that prayer is about being loved by the Father. And that's where we begin. Would you bow with me as I close today? Lord, I thank you today for this mysterious gift that we call prayer. Remind us today, through your word and by your example, that prayer is not just a religious activity, but a lifestyle. Prayer is not a duty, it's a relationship. And that we don't come to you as slaves, but as sons and daughters. So teach us to pray as you prayed. 